December 1st. And the only thing that uh, is changing here is that fiscal year 20 uh, federal highway planning funds are going from uh, roughly 1 million to 1.6 million. And again, that's not any new funds, that's funds that were accounted for in fiscal year 18 and are then being carried over into fiscal year 20. Any questions? And this is a public hearing, so if there's anybody here who has any comments, questions, that wants to address the board? Okay. Seeing none, um, bring it back to the uh, to the board for a, uh, a motion to approve. Move approval. Second. And last, last opportunity for questions, and we'll do a roll call. Mayor Bajowski? Aye. Council Member Albritton? Aye. Commissioner Sofer? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Council Member Rice? Aye. Commissioner Welch? Aye. Council Member Gabbard? Yes. Commissioner Seal? Yes. Commissioner Eggers? Aye. And the eyes have it. Um, <laughs> Seven to three, you. baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have uh, item B. <laughs> who's, who's taking that one? Oh, J Jensen. Yep. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon, board. Good afternoon. Um, Jensen Hackett, um, MPO liaison and planning specialist from the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, so in front of you and included in your packet is the TIP Roll Forward Amendment. Um, this is actually a routine annual process in which projects are identified that were not committed in the previous state fiscal year, so state fiscal year 19. Um, these seven projects that are included are the projects that have been identified. These projects automatically roll into the next fiscal year of the work program, which in this case is fiscal year 2020. This amendment to the TIP ensures that year <coughs> one of the TIP, which was adopted by the Ford Pals MPO board on June 18th, will, that will go into effect on October 1st, matches year one of the FDOT work program. Um, so this is for your approval. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions for Jerry? Move approval. Second. Okay, and this is a public hearing. If there's anybody who'd like to come forward and uh, ask any questions or make any comments. Seeing none, did you get that? Okay. Um, Jackson, and we, yeah, go ahead. Aye. Council Member Albritton? Aye. Commissioner Sofer? Aye. Commissioner Smith? Aye. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Council Member Rice? Aye. Commissioner Welch? Yes. Council Member Gabbard? Aye. Commissioner Seal? Aye. Commissioner Aye. Aye. And the ayes in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> Got to keep it interesting. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it. If I could just add <laughs> something to this. The meaning's still the same. <laughs> so it's always funny to me that we, we do these roll call votes. Uh, there is a state statute that requires when you amend your transportation improvement program, you do it by roll call vote. Um, we've taken the position uh, on the advice of our attorney uh, that we're just going to do roll call votes as a matter of course and not try to nuance which one's a modification, which one's an amendment. Um, it's a fine line and the state statutes are a little vague on that. So we're gonna do these roll call votes for any TIP amendment going forward. And there's a state statute that says all yes votes should be answered. I votes, yes. yes. Right. Yes. So <laughs> half of you all are in violation of state statute. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make that our number one legislative uh, priority. Yeah, really. Uh, okay, uh, this uh, we're going to start the uh, the Pinellas Planning Council public hearing part of our meeting, and um, we'll first ask the four Pinellas staff to present the items, uh, and any of the applicant governments desiring to do so may address their item. Once the reports are given, I will then ask for the proponents of any of the proposals to, to speak, and then opponents. And finally, any other citizen who wishes to comment or ask questions of any of the sub-threshold land use cases. We will, there we will then hear rebuttal by the applicant as necessary and a staff response or summary. By that time, the board will ask questions and I will close the public hearing uh, and the board will deliberate and take action. So that's the kind of the process that we're gonna go under and we'll start with uh, C1. All right, we'll have Jared come back up and cover these items for us. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, so today I'll be walking through uh, CW case countywide plan amendment CW 1914 submitted by the city of Largo. Um, so the city of Largo is seeking to amend the property from residential very low to residential low medium. And the purpose of this amendment is to allow for the development of a single family subdivision with a maximum density of seven and a half units per acre. The location is at 1756 South Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, 
and the area size is roughly 7.2 acres. Uh, the current uses are residential and vacant, and the surrounding uses are residential, public, semi-public, and activity center. Uh, so this is just front of the, the front of the subject property. This is just to the north of the subject property. This is to the east of the subject property. Uh, and here you can see the current category of residential very low. Uh, and just going by the density and intensity standards, it currently does not support the redevelopment into a single family uh, residential uh, for, uh, neighborhood. <clears throat> uh, however, uh, the proposed category of residential low medium uh, does support that redevelopment. Uh, in conclusion, we believe that the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics of the residential low medium category. And on balance, we believe that it can be con con concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the county ride rules. And just in addition to this, we do take into consideration several countywide considerations. And while this case in particular does not impact any of these countywide considerations, because it is greater than five acres and going to a residential low medium category, it is considered a regular countywide plan map amendment. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Is there anybody mm -hmm. from the city of Largo that uh, here that would like to make any additional comments? Mm -hmm. um, okay. I'm representing the city of Largo. Diane Brill with the uh, planning department. Um, I don't have any additional comments, okay. but I'm available if there's any. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. um, any questions? Yes. Mayor. Um, Mayor. Uh, Jowski, sorry. sorry about that. That's, That's okay. okay. I was just going to ask, what's on the back side of the property? It looks like a road or a trail or a sidewalk or a ditch. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> if you look at the uh, the Google map. At CSX. Yeah. CSX. Is that what it is? Uh, it's not labeled anywhere. Tracks. See that on the back side? It's like the front is on Martin Luther King, but what's on the long the back there? Okay, thank you. Mike? Um, mine was just, uh, I always ask how many citizens showed up to come uh, speak about this. I know there was, I heard about this without planning. There were three to four people. Their concerns was the wetlands that were on there. Um, I support this at the moment, but I do know that down in the commission, the commission supported it. But I am at the last one, if this passes today, going to still bring that up a little bit at our next commission meeting uh, with some concerns. Okay, thank you, commission. Anybody else? Okay. Um, do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. Council Member Rice. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Go ahead, Jared. Okay. Um, so this is the countywide plan map amendment, uh, CW 1915, submitted by the City of Safety Harbor. Uh, and the City of Safety Harbor is seeking to amend a property from residential low medium to public semi-public and the purpose of this amendment is to allow for the future expansion of the Safety Harbor Public Works facility. Um, so the location is about 250 feet northeast of the intersection of Railroad Avenue and Booth Street uh, and the area size is roughly 1.74 acres. Uh, the current uses are vacant uh, and the surrounding uses are residential and public semi-public. Uh, so this is just north of the subject property. This is actually the Safety Harbor uh, Public Works facility. Uh, this is just some of the residential to the south of the subject property. Uh, and this is just to the west of the subject property. Um, so here you can see the current category of residential low medium. And um, on our countywide plan map category, we do allow for institutional uses. However, local land use and zoning <clears throat> currently does not support, or that falls under the residential low medium category, does not support uh, the institutional uses necessary for this. Hence the proposed change to the public semi-public category, which would uh, better accommodate the future incorporation of this parcel into the Safety Harbor Public Works facility. Uh, and based on this, we believe that the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the public semi-public category 
And on balance, we believe that it can be con concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. Is anybody from the City of Safety Harbor here that would like to speak to this item? Anything? I don't see anybody. City of Safety Harbor, but not the band. Okay, thank you. Um, any questions? Uh, yes, Commissioner. Was there any citizen comments before this? Come, uh, come forward, please. Come up here and state your name. And I ask this to everyone, so you might want to sit there for the next couple. <laughs> <laughs> name is Paul Bushy, um, Code Enforcement Manager of City of Safety Harbor. Um, Marcy Stenmark sends her apologies. She wasn't able to make the meeting today, so sent me in, so please be kind. <laughs> it's a little out of my wheelhouse here. Uh, there were no public comments. So right now, the site is not designed and it's been, it's not funded. Uh, the mayor and our city manager did meet with the residents and allayed some of their, their concerns, and I understand that the conversation is ongoing. What were a couple of their concerns? You know, I don't have any specifics, though, but I do know the mayor and the, um, and the city manager did have a very positive meeting on site with the, the neighbors. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody? Um, what is the, uh, when the property that looks like backs up, is there a, right away between the property and the residences there or there you... is a, about a 10 foot right away there okay between the residence and the property line so you, you okay all right that was, and what and what is immediately to the east and west on the on the one drawing it shows um it just shows yellow on both sides, and then in the in the actual, I, I just can't tell what that is to the to the property to the east of it, and uh, to the pro, and the pro, now the next picture where you have the actual picture of it. Okay, the property to yeah. the east. to the west, there is a residence there. Okay. And then to the east is. Um, I'm gonna have to punt on that one. I'm pretty sure that's vacant, as well. And um, and. Is this is this approval of this time sensitive? I don't uh, believe so. No. I, what, what concerns me a little bit is that we don't. I mean, you said it was generally a positive meeting, but we don't. We don't have the feedback from the neighborhood. I understand. And uh, this is, uh, in in my mind, it's intruding into a residential neighborhood uh, with what I would imagine will be additional warehouse facilities, and so it'd be it'd be kind of. I think it would be prudent to hear from those folks, um, and they're not going to be here at this meeting, but at least. To have heard from your mayor and your city manager how that meeting actually went and if, what concerns they had mm -hmm. um, that's just my my thinking if it's not time sensitive um, I wouldn't mind it coming back but again I'm just anybody else with comments or questions or so yes mayor whatever anybody wants to do if it's not time sensitive and you you want to hear that information I'm okay with that so we would just table it um, I guess that would be the appropriate, the appropriate thing to do. Yeah, that's what we would. Yeah, I sounds think. like this is a city-initiated city yep. project. Yep. Um, so it's not like we've got developer uh, interests, right? You know, in hand. It's a, it's a public project. Yeah. So that would be great if you could just let them know. We're just wanting to hear how that meeting went and what uh, uh, things you might be doing to help ameliorate the problems that your types of facilities might have on them. So that would be great. I'll be sure to pass that along. So do I have a motion to, oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah. So that we don't have to re-advertise. Okay, thank you for that. Point. And I'd make the motion to table this to our October uh, 4th announced meeting. Second. In a, in a second. Thank you. Anybody else, comments or questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, don't go too far. We got some more for you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, of course. Oh, back it up. Okay. Uh, so now I'll be walking through countywide plan map amendment CW 1916 submitted by the city of Tarpon Springs. <clears throat> uh, so the city of Tarpon Springs is seeking to amend the property from office to residential medium. And the purpose of this amendment is to allow for the subject parcel to develop another single family residence on the property. 
Uh, and the location is at 721 South Diston Avenue, and the area size is roughly 0 0.33 acres. Uh, the existing uses are residential, and the surrounding uses are residential, recreation, open space, and public semi-public. Uh, so this is just the front of the subject property, and that uh, space between the two residential properties that you see there is where the proposed um, new single-family uh, development would go. This is just facing north of the subject property. Uh, this is to the east of the subject property. Uh, this is south of the subject property. And this is uh, to the west of the subject property. Uh, so here you can see the current category of office, uh, which our uh, countywide plan map category of office does support <coughs> residential uses. Uh, however, at the local level, the local planning and zoning uh, does not support the intended residential development. <coughs> Hence the proposed category to residential medium, uh, which would better support uh, the development of an additional single family residence on the current property. Uh, in conclusion, we believe that the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics of, for the residential medium category. And on balance, we believe it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. Is there anybody from the city of Tarpon Springs here that would like to comment? Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, so it's smack dab in the middle between two residential homes, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. What was there prior to it just being an open lot like that? I mean, was do we know? It's just kind of odd that you'd have a piece of commercial property and residential on either side like that. Mm -hmm. Again, Pat McNeese, principal planner with Tarpon Springs. Um, the building that's there now apparently was some sort of an office, like a medical office. Um, apparently, that's where the office designation came from. It is now a single-family home. Uh, the vacant area, I'm not sure if there was ever a structure there. They have been a parking lot for the office or something like that. But um, I do not know if there was a structure in the open area at any time. So there, so there is a building, I'm, because when you were showing the pictures, it just looked like we were looking like at an empty lot. So the part of the property that's being rezoned, was it the gray building or the? Can you pull that picture up? Yes. Okay. Looks like it's on a corner. Because I thought it was just the empty lot when you were showing it. Um, so sorry for the confusion. So when you showed this picture, oh, it must be this. It's yeah. all the I same assume thing. that yeah. so it's the gray building mm -hmm. that's yeah, a part of the point. commercial. Gotcha. Okay, because I was assuming that was the residential when you said smack dab in the middle of it, on either side. <coughs> okay, thank you for. And they're that. using that as a house. That is currently a single family detached dwelling. Yes. Huh. Okay. Okay. Any any other questions? Uh, any comments from the public? That we're on this one. Uh, we had one uh, member of the public speak in support at both planning and zoning board and public commissioners. Are they on that lot or around it? Uh, nearby, but not adjacent. Okay. The right. same resident. Okay. Spoke to both. Any any rationale for the uh, RM versus the RLM that's around it? Um, well, actually, um, uh, surrounding it, uh, north, east, and south, is, is mostly actually RU. Um, and part of the history, this is staff at the staff level at the city. Um, staff did not did not support this, but both planning our planning and zoning board and board of commissioners do want to bring this forward. Um, we asked for RLM because it would accommodate. Um, what the applicant needs. The applicant, in order to build another house, uh, needs an R60 zoning. He needs to split the parcel into two lots that would meet the minimum dimensions for an R60 lot. That's, that's what uh, generated this request. Um, your staff at Forward Pinellas suggested that the RM uh, countywide category would match our RM future land use category, and that is the appropriate category for you to be looking at. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. 
Any other comments, questions? Okay. Will of the board, please. Move approval. Second. Okay. Commissioner Steele. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, so this is countywide plan map amendment CW 1917 submitted by the City of Safety Harbor. Uh, so the City of Safety Harbor is seeking to amend the property from residential low medium to recreation open space. And the purpose of this amendment is to allow for the subject parcel to be added to the Folly Farms Nature Preserve. Uh, so the location is at 1538 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Street North, and the area size is roughly 0 0.5 acres. Um, the existing uses are vacant, and the surrounding uses are residential, preservation, and recreation open space. Um, so this is just facing front of the subject property, and this structure that's actually on there uh, on the parcel now is going to be repurposed by the Safety Harbor Leisure Services Department as a restroom facility <coughs> uh, office and adding some picnic tables and that sort of thing. <clears throat> uh, this is just facing north of the subject property. Uh, this is to the east of the subject property. Uh, and this is to the south of the subject property. Oh, and to the west of the subject property. Um, so here you can see the current category of residential low medium, which at our level does allow for recreation open space uses. Um, however, at a local level, the local zoning and land use does not. Hence the proposed change to recreation open space, which would better support the incorporation of this parcel into the broader Folly Farms Nature Preserve. Um, in conclusion, we believe that the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the recreation open space category. And on balance, we believe it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. <coughs> Thank you, Jared. Uh, any questions for, for Jared? Uh, yes. Or any citizens' comments to this? <coughs> Just have. Any comments, Any from, comments the, from, from the public on this one? I don't see one, no. This is the one I was going to get you on. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry, was that a question? Or yes. a, Were there any comments or concerns or positive support of this? Uh, I think the support was overwhelmingly positive. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> any other comments that you had? No. Okay. Do I have a motion, please? Move to approve. Second. Who was the second, please? Michael Smith. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. One more. One more. <laughs> All right, last one. Um, so, countywide plan map amendment CW 1918, uh, again submitted by the City of Safety Harbor. Um, and the City of Safety Harbor is seeking to amend the local character district designation of the subject property. And the purpose of this amendment is to amend property within the Safety Harbor Activity Center from the local designation of Community Town Center Character District <coughs> to the Public Character District designation. Um, and any amendment to any locally adopted Activity Center Character District or subcategory within that is considered a Tier 2 map amendment. <coughs> so the location is at the north of Main Street and east of 2nd Avenue North. And the area size is roughly 0 0.62 acres. Uh, the existing uses are park, and the surrounding uses are activity center. Um, so this is just front, uh, the front of the property facing north, um, where the parcel is currently being developed into a park facility. Uh, this is to the east of the subject property. This is to the south of the subject property. And this is just west of the subject property. Um, so here, uh, again, on our map, you can see the designation of activity center. However, at a local level, it currently falls under the community town center character district category. And there you can see the associated primary uses. However, giving, given its development into a park facility, the city is lo looking to change it to the public local character district category which on our map does not change. Um, it will stay activity center. 
However, because it is changing the local character district at a local level, it is still subject to the Tier 2 amendment process. And based on this, in conclusion, we believe that the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the activity center category. And on balance, we believe it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in Section 6531 of the countywide rules. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions for staff? Any comments? Oh, no, okay. Go back to that one picture that's we got the vacant land and the, and the mm -hmm. incredibly be beautiful tree. I was going to ask if this included that tree on this property, but it's the property behind it. Um, if you ever get a chance to get to Safety Harbor and look at this, this tree is just the most mm -hmm. magnificent tree. They've actually taken and put a, um, to, just to protect it, mm -hmm. they put a, a wrought iron uh, fence all the way around it and they had a a really nice ceremony kind of commemorating that, that tree, but it is incredible. It's beautiful, so I just bring it to your attention. Thank you. Um, yes? Now you tell me. <laughs> Any proponents or opponents uh, for this? Um, thank you. Um, and uh, no questions? Uh, do I have a motion? Oh, you do. Yes. yes. For the last one, any public comments for or against this? And in the future, is it possible the staff can include that so when the cities come up, we can kind of, we don't, I don't have to ask this if there's some comments or the general direction of a public. We can take care of that. But we okay. love this. <laughs> I don't speak that much. I work in a library. I like. But he quiet. doesn't love it. <laughs> <laughs> The public outreach included 10 meetings uh, beginning in August 6, 2018 through uh, May 6, 2019, including Community Development Agency, the Planning and Zoning Board, and held discussions. Uh, and the public in input was, again, m almost uh, very, very positive. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Welcome you. to our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back anytime. <laughs> I'll just add, for those who don't know, the city um, spent over a million dollars to purchase this property from private interest to avoid development encroaching on this and making it a public park on fronting Main Street. So it's, uh, it's a really big, uh, big effort by the city of Safety Harbor. Yeah. Okay, do I have a motion for this? Make the motion. Second. Second, Second by Commissioner Seal. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Jared. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, moving into item 7A, PSTA activities report. Council Member Rice, you're going to give us the update. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, the PSTA board met on August 28th, and uh, our, a lot of our discussion and decisions um, dealt with the Central Avenue bus rapid transit. The Central Avenue rapid transit project continues to move forward towards the completion of our 60% design stage. Um, in August, we submitted an updated small starts application to the FTA, and uh, we are well positioned to receive a grant agreement from the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, PSTA also moved forward with the purchase of nine 40-foot hybrid electric vehicles for use on the BRT service. Um, they will be purchased using the state consortium contract, which allows for the quickest turnaround and allows PSTA maximum flexibility and how these vehicles uh, may be integrated into the existing PSTA fleet, and it allows for the successful opening of the project on time. The station platforms, which are part of the project, will be designed and built to accommodate a 60-foot vehicle, so there will be little or no retrofitting required as demand on the corridor increases. Uh, tonight, PSTA will hold a 60% design public workshop where the design changes made in response to comments in the 30% design phase will be displayed. Um, PSTA has been taking a lot of time to, to listen and work with multiple constituencies, including the residents and the commission, commissions excuse me, of St. Petersburg, South Pasadena, and St. Pete Beach. 
Um, so we've made changes based on those uh, many conversations. Those changes will be on display and will include a new crosswalk and moved stations in South Pasadena, as well as a change to the end of line station in St. Pete Beach to be located at the county beach park access. Uh, the event is held tonight at 6 p.m. at the City of South Pasadena City Hall. A second workshop will be held prior to our next PSTA board meeting on the evening of September 25th, 2019. And that's my report for our PSTA, uh, our last board meeting. Anybody have any questions for Darden? Thank you, Darden. Uh, Commissioner Seal, can you give us a T-BARDA update? Yes, I do. Um, we had our, T. Barta had our board meeting on Friday, August 23rd, um, and we had election of board officers. We re-elected unanimously the same officers for one more year. Uh, Jim Holton is the chair, Cliff Manuel is the vice chair, and Commissioner Janet Long is secretary treasurer. We approved the interlocal agreement for participation in employee benefit plan through PSTA to allow better um, health access and um, premiums. So that will begin on October 1st. Uh, we took up an amended bylaw for committee member attendance and the board approved allowing attendance of board and committee members through electronic communication such as teleconferencing and video conferencing to count towards meeting attendance. Um, authorize the board chair to appoint alternatives for each board member and set some minimum requirements for attendance at the committee meetings. Our, we, pre, we were presented our fiscal 2020 operating budget, which is going to be $7.5 million and um, it includes resources to support the organization, the commuter assistance program and planning work being performed on the transit vision for Tampa Bay as well as studies for innovative <coughs> technologies, which I'm very excited about. Um, we will vote on that uh, budget in September. And finally, the state lobbying services agreement, we awarded another one-year agreement to RSA Consulting Group for state government advocacy and lobbying services. Uh, it's a piggyback off of PSTA's contract the monthly fee is $8,000, and it's funded by local contributions by the um, t of members, governments. So um, we aren't allowed, of course, to use federal or other um, sor FDOT sources for that type of um, work. Our next board meeting is scheduled for September 27th, 2019, at 10 o'clock at PSTA in um, St. Petersburg. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Seal. Any questions for Commissioner Seal? Okay, great. Appreciate that. Uh, and Wit, I guess we'll go into our uh, Advantage Pinellas update. Today. Right. So this is uh, the <clears throat> first of three meetings in a row where we'll be working toward our long-range plan adoption. And I'll turn it over to Chelsea to start, and then I'll follow up uh, from her. Yeah, good afternoon. Hi, Chelsea. So just uh, it's been a four-phase planning process, and we are now very close to the end. We're in that fourth phase, talking about developing a vision strategy and policy uh, definition. We'll be adopting the plan in November. Um, so we've been doing a, a little bit less outreach in the last few weeks uh, because we're finalizing our list of projects right now. Um, so we are going to be having one more focus group on October 3rd to get that final uh, input into the plan, but we're really just bringing it home. So I wanted to talk to you uh, today about the public outreach that we've done uh, throughout the course of the last couple of years and where we've uh, landed with that. Uh, over the summer, we did our last big push for outreach. We had an online survey through the MetroQuest platform. We called it our Advantage Pinellas survey. It was open for the entire month of July. And in that time, we had nearly 5,000 people participate in the survey. When we did It's Time Tampa Bay last year with uh, Hillsborough and Pasco, we only had about 3,000 people respond from Pinellas County. And that survey was open twice as long. So we're very happy with the results that we got. Thank you all for sharing it uh, with your networks and on social media. Um, we received over 5,000 comments and more than 171,000 data points. So we spent the last two months going through this, sorting the data, um, trying to analyze it, and I want to present the results of that to you today. 
Um, one thing I will note is we did a zip code analysis on the responses, and uh, pretty much every zip code in Pinellas County was within one or two percentage points ver uh, of the survey responses versus their um, uh, population. There were two outliers. Uh, the city of Dunedin uh, had 7% more responses than they had um, uh, residents, so thank you very much. We had a great response from Dunedin. We and have there's, a very vocal group of people. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one zip code in St. Petersburg that was about 2% underrepresented. Um, but overall, it was very close, so we're happy with the representation. While it wasn't statistically valid, we're still very happy with what we got. Uh, on that survey, we had a, a series of screens, uh, and we asked people to weigh in on specific components of the transportation network. Uh, we asked to either rate something one star, which means they hated it, or five stars, which means they loved it. And then there were opportunities for them to provide additional comments as they went through. So for bicycle and pedestrian uh, components, we asked about uh, regular bike lanes, enhanced crosswalks, protected bike lanes, sidewalks, and trails. And you can see a lot of that deep blue color on the right. Uh, there was a lot of support for bike ped infrastructure overall. When it came down to bike lanes, you'll see that there's a little bit more support for protected bike lanes versus regular. When we drilled into the comments, you know, there were a lot of comments of, well, yeah, okay, bike lane is better than nothing, but we really want to make sure that that bike lane is protected from the vehicles. People didn't feel safe on high-speed roadways with just a bicycle lane. And then, of course, a lot of support for trails, and then the enhanced crosswalks. A lot of comments about those uh, rectangular uh, flashing beacons um, and support for those countywide. Kelsey, uh, um, yes. a friend... Uh, went to uh, overseas and they their bike lanes were actually painted a different color. Is that mm -hmm. something that's pretty, is that done over here too? Yes, okay. it is. Uh, we actually have some areas on uh, First Avenue uh, in St. Petersburg and also on Gulf Boulevard. There's some high conflict areas that okay. we've used uh, additional painting and marking for those. For the actual lane gets painted yes. instead of just uh, the mm -hmm. separation. Yes, Mayor. Um, can you explain the one, two, three, four, and five? One star is they uh, did not like it. Okay, and so five, five is the most important correct. kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Five is the most supported. Okay, so they were saying that trails and enhanced crosswalks were the top two. Correct. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, we also drilled down a little bit more into bus service. Uh, as we've been going out and doing our little ball game, we're kind of very high level. Do you support more transit? So we wanted to really get down into what people wanted to see from the transit system. Uh, so we talked about uh, dedicated bu uh, bus lanes, late night service, more frequent service, and weekend service. And weekend service was the one that people wanted to see more of. Uh, when we talked about the dedicated bike lanes, drilling down into the comments, there were a lot of uh, questions about people didn't understand how it worked. They couldn't see it happening. They didn't understand. So there was very kind of lukewarm support uh, across the board for the, the dedicated bus lanes. Uh, but people did see the value in more frequent service and then that weekend service. Uh, we also talked about emerging solutions, looking at automated vehicles, elevated transit, uh, scooters, traffic signal timing, and waterborne transit. Uh, the traffic signal timing, that is very consistent with our statistically valid survey, where about 90% of the people said, time the lights. That's what they want to see, and they want to see us investing in that. Um, when we talked about aut uh, automated vehicles, that was another one where people said, okay, yeah, it sounds great, but I don't see how that works here. I'm never going to give up my car and get behind one of those things. So a lot of confusion, and that, that's where you'll see the lack of support. Um, and then, then on the elevated transit, uh, people really liked that because they said, yeah, transit's great, but I don't want to have to sit behind it in traffic. So get it up above the road and out of my way. Uh, for passenger rail service, we split out local rail versus a regional rail service. Um, and you'll see here there are more five-star ratings for the regional uh, service. Uh, there was a lot of understanding about Brightline and uh, how it's going to be coming into Orlando and into Tampa in the future, hopefully. So there was a lot of support for connecting to that to be able to travel across the state. Uh, and then we looked at streets and highways as well. As well. Uh, interchanges, intersections, uh, maintaining existing roads. Uh, new toll roads, and then widening our existing roads. Uh, maintenance was one that came up repeatedly. People want to see their roads uh, maintained more frequently, uh, resurfacing schedules, uh, improved intersections with turn lanes was another big one, uh, and then interchanges. Uh, that was, The comments were very, very specific to US-19, and the uh, support for uh, new interchanges at Curlew and Tampa and Nebraska specifically. Lots of comments about exactly those areas, which we're moving forward and advancing into our five-year work program, so that's good to see. But if you look at the far right on widened existing roads, there's not a lot of support there. 
Correct. And that's also consistent with the ball game that we've been doing. <clears throat> Whenever we go out and we ask people to uh, put resources into new improvements, maintaining or widening roads, I'm sorry, not maintaining, widening roads or building more roads always receives the least support and, countywide. And toll roads too. Mayor, oh, hold on one second, Mayor. I also wanted to point out the lowest supported thing here, um, toll roads. Yes. So I think that's important for even FDOT to see. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of support for that. And a lot of the comments that we received on just that one were about uh, the East Lake McMullen Booth Corridor, because that was one of the things that we did consider uh, last year when we were looking at regional connections. Uh, so a lot of the comments were, yeah, definitely not on East Lake. Leave my community alone. We don't want to stare at that. Um, but there was support for connecting into the Selman Extension and the Gandy Corridor in St. Petersburg. Um, and this was another uh, exercise that we had people do. We gave them a screen with 10 pennies and asked them to invest those uh, dollars as they would, as they would like to. Uh, one thing I will point out, you'll see the streets and the highways has about 20% um, of, of the total allocation. That's a little bit skewed um, because we did not ask them if it was maintaining roads or building new roads. Uh, so we do have to assume that both of those are in there because across all other outreach we've received, building new roads was not what people wanted to invest in. Uh, but about 40% um, of the investment is in uh, additional transit service. So that was also consistent with other outreach that we've done. Uh, we then had a series of images that we asked people to react to uh, and provide uh, some pretty detailed feedback. You'll see we had everything from a two-lane divided roadway, a roundabout, an elevated toll road, um, and then the bottom left corner, uh, that was a bus queue jump. And these are the results. So on these, the, uh, the ones that are furthest to the left had the most support, and the ones that are furthest to the right had the least. Uh, the US-19 interchanges, again, very popular uh, for the Curlew and Tampa intersections. Uh, we had a rendering of an intermodal center, and people really liked that. They said it made a lot of sense to be able to have bikes, buses, cars, everything all in one place. Um, our two-lane divided and two-lane cycle track, also people liked those. They liked seeing the additional bicycle facilities. Uh, one comment we did get was, this is great, but just don't put anything in the median. People liked their center turn lanes. They wanted to be able to get to where they needed to be. Uh, the bus on shoulder system was a little bit kind of even across. It didn't really have any outliers in terms of one to five star ratings. Um, the comments that we got on that one, some people said, oh, yeah, that makes sense, but what happens if a car breaks down? So there's definitely an educational component that we found to some of these renderings. Uh, moving further over, elevated toll roads did not have a lot of support, just like in an earlier one. And then the roundabouts and the bus queue jumps. Those received overwhelming numbers of uh, one-star ratings. Once we drilled into the comments on those, especially the roundabout, everyone said Clearwater Beach. And we know that that's not the greatest roundabout. There are ex other great examples countywide. Um, a lot of people said, I love roundabouts, but they'll never work in Pinellas County. No one here knows how to drive. It'll never work. <laughs> so we know that there's definitely that education piece that if we're going to be considering these treatments in the future, we need to make sure that we're educating people on how to properly use them and we're getting the word out that way. And then the last one, the bus queue jumps. Again, the same thing. This, uh, I don't understand how this works. Uh, maybe it works somewhere else. It'll never work here. Um, a lot of those comments. New things are hard. Yes. <laughs> Um, so what we've seen with this result is consistently valid feedback from the public. Uh, we did our statistically valid survey. We did its time. We did Advantage Pinellas. We're hearing the same thing everywhere we go. People want us to be investing in other modes of transportation that doesn't just include uh, widening our roadways. So now that we know what the priorities of the public are, we have to figure out how we're going to fund them with the revenues that we have available to us. There are four main funding sources, and I'm going to walk through each of these uh, with you today. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, what we call the Strategic Intermodal System, the SIS. Um, any funding for projects has to be limited to those facili facilities you'll see highlighted in red on that map. And that's roads, intermodal centers, uh, rail, ports. Uh, the funding for these is allocated by the state. It comes out of Tallahassee. And if you think about the major projects that we have remaining in Pinellas County, they're on US-19, they're on Gandy, they're on 275. So these facilities are pretty much taken care of by the state, and they'll be reflected that way in the long-range plan a list of projects when you see them next week, or month, sorry. Uh, and then local funds. Obviously, as Ford Pinnells, we do not control local funds, um, but they are out there, they're highly flexible. They can cover any mode of trans, uh, transportation, and they're based on the local priorities. One thing I do want to highlight is these local funds are very important because they can serve as a local match. 
Uh, there are lots of state and federal dollars out there that require a 50 percent match, and the local governments have to be able to have those resources available to pull in the extra state and federal funding into the future. However, I'll also point out about 100 percent of those funds are already committed <laughs> for local priorities. There's resurfacing, there's drainage work, roadway improvements, sidewalks. We can't really uh, count on the local funds very much for those matching dollars because, again, they're already 100 percent committed. Uh, other arterials is another funding source that we've been looking at. Uh, these are for non-SIS state roads, and I've tried to highlight those on the map for you right there. Those are just all the state roads in Pinellas County. Um, these funds can be used on non-state roads if they, say, relieve a state roadway facility. We've been thinking about 126th Avenue in Pinellas Park or 102nd Avenue in St. Petersburg. These would be great candidates for this um, funding source. However, again, it requires a 50% local match. So if the locals don't have the money, we cannot bring these dollars into our community uh, to make improvements. So when you look at those state roadways, um, with all the SIS facilities already covered, there are very few projects remaining on the state network that we could use these dollars for. We're looking out to 24, 2045 right now and balancing our revenues and our projects. Uh, our first cut we just got uh, the other day, and when we are assigned this revenue source proportionally in the Tampa Bay area, we're going to be leaving about $800 million on the table over the course of the next 20 years because we do not have the local dollars to match this funding source and bring it in. So we'll bring you more information on this next month as we move forward, but just wanted to get that on your radar. Uh, we have talked to some members of the legislative delegation about this funding source and asked for additional f flexibility in the future so that we can flex it um, a little bit more easily, but that'll just be something that we'll have to keep on our radar. And then the last is our TMA funds, our Transportation Management Area funds. These come into the urbanized area, highly flexible, cover all modes of travel. This is really that funding source that we're going to be able to use to advance the priorities of the agency uh, that aren't just tied to widening roadways and maintaining existing roads. So this is the one that we really want to make sure that we're matching with the public outreach that we've been receiving. So what we're recommending to do, and again, we're going to bring you final numbers next month, um, is we are looking to set aside a million dollars a year for complete streets improvements, a million dollars a year for technology that could include timing the traffic lights, um, additional technologies that we don't even know about yet, but we want to box that money and set it aside in the long-range plan so that we have it for future projects. Uh, about $2 million for capital transit investments. That would be a million and a half for PSTA bus replacements. And then $500,000 for other regional transit service that has not yet been identified. But again, as those projects come up, we'll have the funding set aside so that we can uh, contribute towards them. We've also been working on our active transportation plan, our bike ped master plan. Um, and we do have a list of uh, 10 corridors where we'd like to make improvements to. We've identified about $58 million in improvements, and we have fully funded those in the long-range plan as well over the course of the next 25 years. Um, and then once all that money was already allocated, we still have a few million dollars left over for about four or five overpasses uh, along major trail crossings and major roads throughout Pinellas County. Uh, so our next steps, again, we just got our revenue assessment in the last few days. So we're going to be refining that in the next couple of weeks. We'll bring you a draft next month, uh, right before your plan adoption in November. We'll have that focus group uh, in early October to uh, kind of get that last little feedback. Did we get it right? Is this where we should be putting our transportation dollars? Uh, and then, yes, in uh, November, we'll ask you to adopt the final plan. And what's going to take over on some stuff? I don't know if anyone had any questions on these two slides. Well, we may come back to you. Okay, let me know. Okay. Thank you. Right, strange perspective. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do is just take a few minutes to bring everybody together. We've not made this presentation to the full board, but I think you all know that we've been having um, a lot of uh, good conversations, working relationships with the county administrator, with PSTA, to put together a countywide transportation strategy. Uh, and I'm just going to touch on a few things, um, really focus on enhancing the transit service component. This is a major feature of our long range plan. Uh, and um, I want to talk about how we built this. Uh, some of you have gotten this presentation, but I know others have not. Um, the main thing we want to do with transit is figure out a way to better connect our local workforce needs and affordable housing with transportation accessibility. Uh, and I think that leakage, linkage is really important. So the map you see in front of you here is our uh, so-called investment quarters, uh, where we really want to look at opportunities to double down on investment in uh, workforce training, uh, affordable housing and, and accessibility. Uh, and 
This map shows the Central Avenue Bus Rapid Transit Corridor, which is in design. It shows the I-275 Corridor, which is in the PD&E phase uh, through t with state funding. And then it shows other quarters in Pinellas County that lend themselves to greater regional connectivity or greater intra-county connectivity. And the ones that are in blue, uh, 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 East Bay, Roosevelt, uh, Alt-19, and uh, a portion of 34th Street, US-19, are the ones that we have prioritized. Uh, we also are focusing on ensuring that PSTA has the resources to maintain uh, its basic level of fixed route service today. Uh, so this would be an enhancement over the existing fixed route services today. Uh, so we came up with this by identifying a series of indicators. Uh, what are we trying to connect? Uh, and then what quarters uh, best connect those indicators? Those are investment quarters. And what quarters should we prioritize for enhanced transit? And those are the priority quarters. I won't go into great detail, but it was a data-driven process. And we looked at redevelopment potential. We looked at where housing is that is affordable or could be built that's affordable. We looked at where the people are and where the employment is. And one of the challenges we have in Pinellas County is that our employment is spread sort of peanut butter-like all over our county. We have jobs everywhere, but we don't have 50,000 in one district. Um, so that makes transit planning a little more of a challenge than, say, in a center city location. When you combine all those indicators, though, you do see some patterns that emerge. And this map shows that in Tarpon Springs, uh, in Clearwater, in the Gateway area, in, in uh, Midtown, St. Petersburg, and in a few other pockets, we have uh, a, a number of these indicators overlapping that provide opportunities for connectivity. And that's how we identified these investment quarters. And Sarah Caper of our staff did a lot of this work. Uh, and we're really looking at um, creating a framework where we can have public-private partnerships to enable the private sector to build the affordable housing and range of housing options, some affordable, some not affordable, that we need in this county. Um, and then this has been reinforced by our countywide plan, and you all uh, transmitted to the county uh, uh, planning authority changes in land use uh, intensity and density along these corridors, and the county will act on that uh, in October. So for the priority quarters, I'm just going to highlight a few of these. Uh, the, the service is intended to be limited stop express bus service. Uh, at this point, we're not talking anything about um, changing the lane configuration, but limited stop express, 15 minute frequency, later evening service, weekend service are things we don't have now. And this would be overlaid on existing local service. Uh, and the three are US 19 South, Roosevelt East Bay, and uh, Alt 19. So for US 19 South, some of the things we looked at here uh, we have a lot of opportunity zones. We have multiple activity centers. We have a high percentage of zero-car households and high population densities. Uh, we have developed some capital and operating costs with PSTA for the service profile. And this is uh, the quarter where um, the speaker earlier uh, talked about the uh, conversion of some of the lanes down here for business access and transit. That would be from approximately 54th Avenue South to 22nd Avenue South. And there is uh, excess capacity in that quarter, and we are making improvements to I-275 parallel to that. So we feel confident that we won't be creating a traffic problem down there. Uh, but that is still subject to the state review through their uh, um, advisory uh, committee uh, that reviews all of these lane conversions. For Roosevelt East Bay Drive, uh, we are connecting a number of residential areas with medical office and our higher wage manufacturing jobs in the Gateway, Mid-County area. About 15% of this quarter had an income below poverty. This supports our Gateway Master Plan and would tie directly into a potential Gateway Intermodal Center that has now been narrowed down to uh, a handful of sites. Uh, the Alt-19 corridor uh, has about 5,500 homes with no cars. It ties directly into a medical uh, jobs corridor uh, in South Clearwater. It also serves the uh, South Greenwood uh, neighborhood uh, and a lot of low-income neighborhoods in South Clearwater uh, and a number of opportunity zones and five activity centers. Uh, again, this would be frequent, reliable service along uh, essentially Route 18, which is one of the most productive cross-county routes in in Pinellas County, through Seminole, through Largo, uh, right by Largo High School. That, that route includes the VA? It does. It ties directly into the VA. It comes down to the Central Avenue corridor as well. Thank you. 
Uh, now, Manatee County has an express service that comes in from Manatee County to the VA, so you could argue this would provide uh, access for people coming from Manatee County to transfer and get to jobs elsewhere in Pinellas County. And, and we do see a lot of growth in northern Manatee County coming to jobs in our county. Uh, in addition, uh, we've been working with PSTA to maintain and strategically enhance existing transit service. The Tarpon Springs uh, example uh, that was recently implemented to provide medical trips to the hospital at a lower cost is a great uh, template, and we see that being replicated in other parts of the county, also serving seniors and veterans and disabled residents throughout the, the area. But this does require uh, some infusion of cash for PSTA over the long term in order to not cut service. So that is reflected in these calculations. Uh, and then uh, PSTA identified a number of feeder routes that would be uh, improved. Uh, these would be uh, services that are local and they exist today, but improving frequency and timing and span of service to provide connections into these priority corridors. Now, uh, a lot of things can happen to change the three priority quarters that we've identified, but these are the ones that make the most sense from a workforce and housing opportunity connectivity standpoint. Uh, but we've been having conversations with Pasco County about the US-19 North Corridor, and with significant sections of that corridor undergoing design in the next several years for some kind of improvement, overpasses <coughs> or innovative intersections, uh, this would be a great time to have a service concept in, in play that we can work with Pasco County on developing. And I think that's something that could be uh, a joint funding request to the state uh, for a partnership uh, with Pasco and Pinellas. Uh, the other corridor is State Road 60. Obviously, we hear a lot from Clearwater and Clearwater Beach and the Chamber and the tourism industry, and that would tie directly to Tampa International Airport and then potentially on to the Brightline Virgin connection in Tampa, should that come someday. Uh, so all of these have been transmitted uh, to TBARDA for consideration in the regional transit development plan that they're working on now. Uh, our view and the county's view is that transportation is a means to an end, not an end to itself. Uh, we provide transportation so that we can live better lives and we can have access to jobs and we can uh, build up our economy. And uh, we need housing for that to happen. We need housing in Pinellas County for that to happen. Otherwise, our workforce is going to continue to have challenges in the future if people can't buy here and if people are having hour-long commutes from Pasco or Manatee or Eastern Hillsboro where they can't afford to buy uh, um, and have a variety of homes. So uh, the challenge is on us to create that, um, that market for, for better housing closer to where people want to work and be. Uh, so we've come up with some costs. Now I'm going to um, couch this in that these do not yet reflect the input from the cities on what their needs are, and we're asking the cities to provide input on transportation needs of countywide significance. So we're not talking sidewalks to elementary schools, but we are talking um, projects that would provide greater connectivity to um, jobs and, and um, support uh, countywide networks. Um, and we've gotten St. Pete's information that's being refined, and we should in the next couple of weeks be getting additional input from all the cities. Uh, we've also been um, uh, reaching out to uh, chambers and other business groups and meeting with different community groups to get feedback on this as, um, as a strategy. And, and I want to stress here that regardless of where we come up with this money or whether we come up with this money, the policy alignment, I think, is what's important, is that we are committing as a county to look at housing and workforce development as a strategy that is framed with transportation. And I think that's really something that we need to speak about. Uh, and, and we have been talking about where potential funding might come from because, as you know, PSTA is capped. Uh, we only get so many funds as the MPO. And as Chelsea just mentioned, a lot of those funds that come into uh, the counties uh, from the state are not fungible. They're limited to certain funding areas. And uh, our county, like Miami-Dade, like Broward, uh, is not um, able to deliver all those projects to take in all that funding. So it's a little bit inequitable for a county like us. Uh, so we are asking for some flexibility, but we know we have to step up if we want to have that flexibility. A uh, local option fuel tax would bring in a minimum amount of money, um, but it's, that's still important. Uh, so that's about $180 million over 10 years. Uh, we have been looking at different options for the transportation sales surtax like Hillsborough passed last year. Uh, a half cent would bring in about a billion over 10 years. 
Uh, there have been discussions of different increments of that up to a full cent, and we'll see how that conversation goes. Uh, ad valorem would be borne by Pinellas County um, taxpayers uh, only and not tourists. So that's another option, but that's uh, maybe a little less palatable. Just quickly, there are a lot of complementary efforts surrounding this. There's a joint review committee that's been meeting over the last several months to look at how the Penny 4 funds for housing and economic development would be allocated. And a strong consideration here are these investment corridors uh, from a geographic standpoint and from a linkage standpoint. Uh, we are in the very beginning stages of looking countywide at an affordable housing strategy and what that might look like. And I think Ford Pinellas is gonna play a significant role in that uh, going forward in 2020. Uh, Linda Fisher of our staff has been our point person working with Jill Silverboard, the county's chief of staff. Uh, and they are working toward a uh, Board of County Commissioner's workshop on this housing strategy sometime in early 2020. Uh, and then our role uh, as Ford Pinellas, I think, may evolve depending on the policy direction from the Board of County Commissioners next year to look at the economics, the urban design, and regulatory reform in each of these investment corridors because if we don't make it easier for development to happen, we're going to continue to face the ch same challenges of redevelopment being an impediment uh, to providing the types of development we need in the county. So we'll see how that goes, but I'll be coming back to you probably next budget cycle about what that looks like uh, as we go forward. Uh, the next steps are to have a Board of County Commissioners work session in October to give feedback on what we're hearing from the community. Uh, I met with the St. Pete Chamber Transportation Committee yesterday. Uh, they are going to be doing some research with their members and giving some feedback to the county administrator in the near future. Um, and then we'll need to make a decision by January if this is going to be a ballot referendum in 2020. Um, just because of the new timelines that have been established by the state legislature. I just wanted to make sure everybody was up to speed on these conversations. I think I've talked individually to everybody, um, but this is, and I've gone to the city of Bel Air Bluffs, and I know uh, Barry uh, Burton and I are tag teaming going around the county and making different presentations. So um, we're being transparent, we're being very open about this. Uh, Barry has asked me to develop a framework for uh, transparency in all of these projects and how they go forward, assuming that there is a funding strategy put in place. Uh, and I would like to think that Ford Pinellas can be that body that recommends projects for funding, uh, regardless of the funding source. And we're a countywide body. We have advisory committees, and we don't have a dog in the hunt. We don't operate and maintain or build. We just hopefully make good decisions. So with that, uh, I'll open it up to any questions that you might have of Chelsea or me about any of these items. Mayor. Uh, Wit, thank you for the presentation. Uh, the city of Dunedin uh, did have you come out and speak to us, and of course, you're going to be speaking to our mayor's council. So thank you. Um, and of course, I'm very supportive of of the direction we're going. Um, what I'm going to say, you've heard before, and this particular PowerPoint may not have been updated, but when I look at <clears throat> your three priority corridors, <clears throat> excuse me, and the data-driven four key indicators, it does not include tourism. And um, I think that's problematic because, as I've been quoting to everyone, uh, we have 15 and a half million annual visitors. 90% of those people are coming by car uh -huh. or with a car as compared to our one million people that actually live here and so I think yes we have to look at <coughs> and yes we have to look at where there's affordable housing and yes we need to look at where future development occurs but I also think we need to look at tourism and where are they going because it's that clog of people that are causing the congestion and I really think when we look at our priority corridors when I see that I think yes, that's that's ab that's absolutely a good couple of roads to focus on. But to not not have a priority corridor, at getting people from the airport to the beach, or looking at Alt 19, where all of the little beaches are, and not making that a priority, or or whatever, other people smarter than me will figure out where people are going when they get here. Mm -hmm. And even even in the report I'm quoting on tells you the top locations. Mm -hmm. Besides Clearwater Beach and St. Pete, Madeira, Treasure Island, and then there's a couple of other ones, and the top things that they're visiting. 
I think if we don't analyze that and include that in this <coughs> transportation plan, we're short-sighting short ourselves. So I was disappointed not to see the word tourism as a key indicator because I think it absolutely has to be. Yeah, and I did put that in the presentation for Dunedin. You did. This is a little older, uh, but I recognize that, and you're right. Absolutely right. That's why I put State Red 60 in here. That's critical. That's a key tourism corridor. Uh, Alt 19 is something uh, we have a meeting Friday morning uh, to kind of regroup and talk about uh, some North County uh, additions to this, and Alt 19 will probably come under discussion there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments at this time? Okay. I did, yeah. uh, yes. Out of the question. <laughs> On one of you, you said 10 years. What, what capped it at 10 years? Is there a reason just 10? No, we just looked at 10 for uh, identifying the capital cost and having a basis for estimating those costs. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a starting point. Um, right now, you know, if this um, program were to be in effect, we're not talking about a 10 year only window. That's the penny for Pinellas, and that has uh, a 10 year renewal mm -hmm. option. But at this point, the 10-year was just to identify cost for a defined period of time. Okay. I like the spokes, the, the, the wheel. I think, honestly, we should have been doing it from the beginning, but that's just my opinion. Um, when you talked about the, the, the committee that talks about allocation of the penny four, mm -hmm. um, can you get a little bit more into that of the affordable housing part? Sure. Uh, so there was equal amounts of dollars set aside for economic development and affordable housing sort of off the top for countywide needs mm -hmm. in those two categories. And a joint review committee was created uh, that is reflective of the composition of the Ford Pinellas Board. So uh, it is comprised of staff from the cities, the county, um, in, and the 10 beach communities. So it's just like our board. And they've been meeting uh, at least monthly, if not more frequently than monthly. And they're going to have a report ready in November. Okay. Any other question? Uh, They're developing criteria for how that money gets allocated or how people can apply for those funds and how it gets reviewed. Okay. And we, we just had Barry present this to the, our city, which was, th thank you. He did a wonderful job. Um, the kind of question I, I brought up to him, and I was curious, why are we not talking to state reps at the moment about this and showing them this? We are. And are we, okay. I've been meeting with every one of our state legislative delegation members. So what are their comments or concerns? They've been overwhelmingly supportive of the approach. Okay. In fact, um, um, some of our more conservative members have said, I love it. This is great. Um, and I didn't really expect that. Um, so I think there's, uh, there's a desire to see that we have an aligned strategy and that we're putting our resources together. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Janie Grant, in particular, sat down and spent an hour with me. Um, talking about this and giving me a lot of feedback. Nick DeSegli did the same thing, and I sent him the PowerPoint presentation afterwards because he wanted to really dive into it a little bit, and I just got really positive feedback, um, and, and I met with Senator Brandis about it, um, and the feedback um, has ranged from everybody, but generally speaking, very supportive of the, of the approach and the recognition that affordable housing is a huge problem in Pinellas County, and this is one way to help tackle that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for now? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to make a brief comment as we go through this discussion. And um, I would at some point, maybe from Barry, like to see some information of what we're looking at to base a decision on whether it's a penny or a half cent or a quarter cent. Um, I know a half cent is probably politically more palatable, but I would just like to see um, exactly what funds would be able to cover which uh, <coughs> projects. And I, I'd just like to see some data backing that decision. Okay, I'll take that back. Okay. And you Thanks. meant half, half a cent's more palatable than a quarter of a percent or than a percent? Uh, okay, sure. <laughs> okay. Palatable's oh, in the eye <laughs> of the, the beholder. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing that the, the, the question was asked here too was, are we talking just ten years or twenty years or thirty yeah. years? So if, if you're if you're a limited time frame, you know that's one thing. But if you have if you're expecting this to be a you know not a ten year renewal kind of thing, it may be something different. So, yeah. That's a, that's an important part too. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, we're going to talk about some really good roundabouts now. So, <laughs> or at least one good roundabout. <laughs> well, as opposed to the roundabouts where we got the uh, feedback that wasn't very positive. 
uh, was more which was more about Clearwater's big roundabout, right? We have Craig Craig Fox here from the yeah. Florida Department Thank of Transportation you. <laughs> today. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, afternoon. Thanks for having me here today. So I'm here to report about the uh, Palm Harbor Roundabout on Alt 19 of Florida Avenue, Avenue that the department is proposing, and just have a presentation I'd like to go through with that. So just some background information on the corridor. Uh, as of 2018, we had around 21,500 vehicles uh, travel along Alt 19. Uh, currently, it's a two 11-foot through lanes with its center two-way turn lane, and there are bike lanes in each direction, along with the Pinellas Trail on the west side. And it is also right there in the core center of downtown Palm Harbor, as, as you all um, know. So a little bit of the project history. So the department received multiple requests for a signal at the intersection of Alt-19 and Florida Avenue. Unfortunately, uh, those requests did not meet the federal guidelines as far as the signal warrants concerned, so the department was not able to install a signal at that location. Uh, the department did come in with several solutions, or, or several proposed solutions, um, to really address the core kind of concern. And um, what the community was saying was that they wanted a safe crossing across Alt-19 um, because, there's, of course, there's different events that go down uh, with um, you know, the, the community center and the park to the west along with the docks too. So the department came with two proposals. Uh, one was a roundabout of Florida Avenue. The department was recently getting into roundabouts there and, and, and well, at the time, so it was roundabouts were coming up more and more as a potential solution for some intersections where a signal may not be a viable option. And we also looked into a traffic signal at Alt-19 and Nebraska Avenue, which would, which, you know, would be able to install a signal there according to the uh, traffic conditions. So we discussed the project, uh, the, the two proposals uh, with state senators, the county commissioners, and also the Palm Harbor uh, Fire Chief. We also in Plantis County, uh, there were great partners in meeting with local businesses to gauge uh, their input on it too. And we went ahead and held two public workshops, one on September 29th and another one on December 8th with the two proposed options about uh, Nebraska Avenue signal and also the roundabout at Florida Avenue. Um, from the feedback from the community, uh, we kind of held off on moving forward with one of the two options and decided instead to go forward with a RFB, a mid-block crosswalk that was installed at the end, well, around August of 2018. And we also ran an analysis of that RFB just to see what kind of, you know, what were drivers yielding to pedestrians um, and what just the kind of activity was going on. So. Uh, drivers are yielding to pedestrians at a, at a decent rate, around 79% of the time they yield to pedestrians. Um, however, the department would like to increase that, and since we do have an opportunity to just all around about it at the inter intersection, we believe that will be a better option uh, for uh, the high volume of, of, of you know, um, bikes and pedestrians. through there. Yes, sir? When you say percentage, can you break that in numbers? Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, so I don't, I, I have the breakdown in a report, I don't have that off the top of my head, okay. but it's around, what we're saying about, for the observed times that a pedestrian went up and hit the, the, um, the signal, mm -hmm. that they yielded to that pedestrian around 79% of the time. So the other percentage of the time, they didn't yield to the pedestrian, they just kind of just drove straight through. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the current concept of the roundabout. Um, it will involve, as you can see on the west side, shifting the Pinellas Trail a little bit to the west. Um, and if you look on the uh, southeast side, it does look like there's a corner clip around there. We are working with it. We are still very early on in the design. We are, of course, are trying to avoid any right, avoid any right away impacts um, at all. Um, but just, I just want to bring it up just in case anybody, you know, notices it. Um, but that is the proposed design. Of course, um, this is just a conceptual based design. We are very, we are in the very early stages of the design process right now. So it is subject to change, but that's the current concept. Um, and also, uh, one thing we need to do, uh, we are gonna have to remove that mid-block crosswalk to the north, but we are going to add those flashing RFBs at each four legs of the roundabout. So pedestrians will still have the ability to have assisted um, control in crossing that, that roundabout too. It looks like uh, also okay. that you're gonna be shifting the trail a little bit to the yes. west here. Yes. Yes, yes, we'll be shifting the trail a little bit uh, to the west in order, and, and that's in there so that because you didn't want folks coming up pretty much crossing in the middle, you know, of the circle, we had to shift it to the west so that they have a safer uh, location across. So the existing RFB will be removed, but uh, like I said, all legs of the roundabout will have RFBs there to still provide a safe crossing. We are going to shift the trail to the west. 
Um, the design does impact the two current uh, sculptures out there. <laughs> we are going to relocate them still within the corridor, and we are in, we are engaging with Pinellas County as far as you know what location within the corridor uh, to lo to relocate those in. Um, so we're not currently funded for construction, uh, but the department is currently seeking different avenues to fund uh, the roundabout. And also, we're going to conduct a public workshop and a virtual public hearing, and I've got the dates on the slides uh, to come. So upcoming public engagement. We're going to have a joint public workshop uh, on Thursday, November 4th. The location is the Palm Harbor University High School. Uh, we are, it's going to be a joint one with Pinellas County also, as they'll be presenting the updated master plan to Palm Harbor at the same meeting. So it's a good, uh, you know, good engagement opportunity for folks to come through. And also, we'll be having a virtual public hearing. And this one is more focused on any access changes uh, that we may have. And when I say access, I uh, can't really go back. Um, since roundabouts have to have like that kind of center median, uh, there is that property on the southwest corner. Now they can come out and just easily make a left turn. Uh, they'll be able to still make that movement, but they may have to actually go through the roundabout. Uh, that's, an, that's kind of the worst case scenario as far as access changes. Again, we're still very early on in the design, so we are uh, we, we will know more about that um, at the time that this public hearing comes up. But that'll be that the virtual public hearings, uh, they're held both at the district office in Tampa. We're also going to have a location out here in the Palm Harbor community. And it will also be able, folks will be able to log in online also and view it through a webinar. So there'll be multiple ways to actually engage with that. Yes, sir. The question, um, mm -hmm. I've said it a couple times, mm -hmm. but and I don't know if there's an opportunity to do this, but if mm -hmm. you could um, set up that design mm -hmm. somewhere, um, uh, Ideally, it'd be great to set up a, um, a design like that right where it is and put tape down and, and just kind of let people experience it. I was thinking more about like up at the high school where you could actually put a roundabout mm -hmm. uh, on, the, on the ground and put mm -hmm. some cones up and let people kind of mm -hmm. drive through it and just kind of experience it. It's not, it really isn't a, a, a big deal, but mm -hmm. I think people just if they can touch it maybe, mm -hmm. it might might be helpful. Just, just an idea. I don't know how that fits into all of this, but... Mm -hmm. Still that out. No, yeah, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, where the it shows on the concept of it being brick, is that going to be raised or is it grade or what's your proposal? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's actually shown more to not necessarily indicate the actual uh, type of material that we use. That's more shown to just indicate that there's going to be what we call a truck apron. And the reason why we put that in there is because now, oh, sorry, just an extra detail uh, uh, related to that question too. Uh, the roundabout, because we're trying to keep the size small so we can have the least if hopefully no right of way impacts as possible, um, 18 wheelers, what we call a WB60, uh, they won't be able to make, if they're coming on Alt-19 southbound, they won't be able to make a left turn. However, um, based on the, the county concept, trucks are not allowed necessarily on Florida Avenue. And we did do a, a couple, you know, just to, just to make sure that everything works out good. There's a gas station on the northeast corner. Uh, they get the fuel actually delivered um, on a different location. So, so we're not going to be affecting kind of that business access. Um, but that truck apron is in there so that if a larger vehicle was going through there, it, 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 it is a mountable curb so that they'd be able to mount that curb and have a little more extra space where they can actually go ahead and make that movement. So it'll be a curb then? Yeah, yeah it'll be a curb, but, it, but it'll be a mountable curb that, that trucks can, can, can easily get so on if they had to. It's soft as opposed to like a... Yes. <clears throat> and and actually, we have actually some examples of that, not in the slides, but um, of some existing roundabouts in Tampa that I can, I can go ahead and forward to you to, okay. to better kind of explain I'd that. like to see it just... Yes, um, I just was using a roundabout the mm -hmm. other day mm -hmm. and um, just... The curve that they had, mm -hmm. you could tell people had probably gone over it so many times it was cool. just well marked. And I thought, you know, mm -hmm. really is important how mm -hmm. you design it so that people can get through it properly yes, and safely. Definitely, definitely, yeah. And and so trucks and because we know there is the the dock to the west, so a truck with a trailer with a boat trailer will be able to make that movement. A bus will be able to that make that movement. Um, an 18 wheeler will be able to go to north south through that roundabout very easily. Uh, they may be able to make a right turn, but a left turn is, of course, more challenging because more challenging movement. But there is a pretty good grid network set up around that area where they fire trucks access. get through that no problem. Yes. And they, they can turn left. There. Yes, yes. Fire trucks can turn up okay. and make all okay. the movements. Yes. Councilman. And I have one other question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. The rectangular flashing beacons. Yes, sir. Um, how are they working? 
they're, they're working pretty good. Right now, we're getting around 79% compliance by drivers when they see that okay. um, in the existing mid-block crosswalk. And the roundabout can further enhance that because uh, the first thing ed everybody does when they come to roundabout is that they slow down. And so, and speed, of course, is, is one of the major factors in, in pedestrian in, in pedestrian harm when they hit by a vehicle. So not only will uh, drivers approaching it, they'll already be slowing down just as a default, but when the pedestrian hits it, that'll give a, you know, that RB would get a very <coughs> good visual cue. And since the driver already had their foot on the brake, they're even more likely to even stop at the, uh, uh, when they see that also. Mm -hmm. Is there a question? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, I think your description was a Miami curb versus an upright curb where they could go up on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, in our roundabout in Clearwater, we took that out because it was attracting pedestrians out in the middle of the roundabout. Mm -hmm. And um, even though we had signs that said no public mm -hmm. access, we were getting <laughs> old people and baby carts and everything, you know, going to the middle of the roundabout. So yeah. it might not be the same situation here with the mm -hmm. pedestrians, but uh, that might be a concern. So keep your head up for that. Yes, sir. We'll do. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. And I um, think, um, so the next, so yeah, so these are the two upcoming dates. We're also uh, going to schedule a meeting uh, with the fire chief. Uh, we're looking to schedule that probably around the last uh, week of this month. So there's ample time between then and, and the first uh, public meeting. And I think that's all I have right now. This is my contact information. I can just add yes. something real quick. Um, I like to do field work. And so I went to the local business right adjacent to this. Uh, Divine Brewing, and I asked the bartender, <laughs> um, you know, what they thought about the roundabout and um, that might be coming. And she said, "Oh, we're we're okay with it. Anything that'll help me not wait 20 to 30 minutes to make a left turn to go yes. north to where I live in Tarpon." Mm -hmm. And so, in peak mm -hmm. season, you have so much north-south traffic there; it's really hard for folks to get out. The roundabout should help ingress and egress along Florida Avenue to all those businesses in there. Um, so I just wanted to find out what they thought of it since they're going to be the one that's as impacted as anybody and I didn't realize that it was that difficult to get out and make a left turn on Alt-19. Mm -hmm. So field yeah. work is always good. Yeah, and, and, and um, there's a uh, the golf carts um, mm -hmm. up in that uh, area on mm -hmm. the west side are, mm -hmm. are being used, but we're, we're finding that they're crossing Alt-19 mm -hmm. into downtown, which is not legal, mm -hmm. not allowed. Mm -hmm. We're looking at... Um, providing some kind of uh, availability of usage on the east side, but we're going to have to get folks across the road. And we've, I know we've done that in other areas down in Dunedin. We do it twice to, to get, to get uh, from an area of town to another. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly this tr slowing folks down here mm -hmm. is going to be important, mm -hmm. in, in, including that piece that is yet to come. Uh, mm -hmm. So the FDOT will have another ask, I'm sure, down the road. Okay. Uh, <laughs> from us as they usually do. They're always so flexible and adaptable. It's great. <laughs> so thank you. No problem. Anything else? Yes. Um, it, it, since this is, seems to be a going thing with, uh, with F, uh, FDOT, mm -hmm. um, could you try to get it out to other cities who in the future will be looking at this for the, just their, you know, they may not think about coming and attending something like this. <clears throat> Okay. Um, just so they can kind of get visualization or see okay. what you're doing now. So if in the future they get one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll work with them to get information out to everybody. In the virtual public hearing, we'll, I'm sure there are a lot of people in Pinellas County who will be interested in that. We'll share that too. Uh, Sarasota County did some really good innovative uh, public involvement techniques with the department district one down there on roundabout. So uh, that may be something we can look at too. Okay. Thank you. Right, Appreciate thank you. it. Appreciate it. Okay, we're moving on to our annual call for projects. All right, we're going to have uh, Chelsea and Rodney tag team on this one. All right, so in years past, uh, we've really kind of just had the Complete Streets grant uh, that we've awarded on an annual basis. A couple years ago, we started with the planning and placemaking. Uh, now we're also going to be doing a call for transportation alternatives projects. So right now we have three different grant projects that we're going to be asking for applications for. So instead of blasting everyone three times in emails where you're probably going to lose it, and then having staff having to manage three different time periods for all of this being done, we're proposing that we do it all together. We'll issue a single call for projects in the next couple of weeks, have one due date by the uh, in middle of December and then get those projects awarded and funded early next year so we just oh, there you go that's what I said so 
Uh, just wanted to run through the different grant programs that we have going on right now, just to make you aware in case some of your staff come to you uh, for uh, information. Uh, the first one is the Transportation Alternatives Program that funds pedestrian and bicycle projects and also infrastructure to improve non-driver access uh, in mobility. Um, so very high level, uh, we are, uh, the, the program has a minimum grant award of $300,000 and a maximum award of $2 million. Uh, we are proposing that we will select a maximum of four projects to fund. That way we don't uh, keep maintaining a very lengthy list of projects. And then we are limiting each jurisdiction, jurisdiction to only two submittals. Um, on the adopted uh, uh, TA list, there are a couple local governments that do still have uh, projects that have not yet been funded. So if they have existing projects on um, our current priority list, we are allowing them to submit three. Uh, and then the prerequisites for that program is there has to be some kind of local commitment for the project. 100% of the right-of-way or easement has to have already been acquired. And uh, then the local agency program or LAP certification is going to be required of anyone submitting an application or they have to have an agreement with a LAP certified agency. Um, and I won't walk through all of this, but there is a very technical scoring process uh, involved with this, unlike some of our others that are a little bit more subjective. Uh, but all of the scoring was developed uh, in coordination with our local governments, um, and everyone has signed off on this. And then we also have our Complete Streets program. Uh, this is the fourth year for that program, where we'll provide up to $100,000 uh, for a planning study uh, of Complete Streets for concept and up to a million dollars for construction. Uh, one change this year, we are going to be limiting those construction dollars to non-state roads. Um, we've had a lot of success with DOT when they've seen a concept uh, developed for one of their roadways. They've kind of already gone ahead and programmed funding. Uh, so we want to make sure that if we're going to be evaluating these projects and making a recommendation, um, that those are the ones getting funded and not just all of the other ones as well. Um, and then uh, the <coughs> scoring for this, uh, there's no technical scoring, uh, it's more subjective, uh, but the, the key driver is to make sure that we're leveraging that transportation funding uh, to bring about transformative land use change. And then there are a few prerequisites for this program as well. And then we'll have a subcommittee uh, come together to evaluate the projects. Again, that very broad uh, criteria. And then the onus is on the local government to be able to provide or to provide the information to help the subcommittee uh, review the applications and make the best choice uh, for funding. And uh, for the planning and placemaking grant, as you recall, that is a uh, pilot program that we rolled out about three years ago to be a complement to what our uh, our MPO uh, colleagues are doing uh, on the transportation side, so it serves as a land use uh, counterpart for uh, focused planning in our activity centers and multimodal corridors where we want to see increased uh, densities and intensities and more level of activity. And uh, we've been pleased with the applications we've got and, and funded so far because they've been very broad. What we've found is that activity centers and multimodal corridors are in various stages of maturity around the county. And so the challenges that they're trying to address now are a little more complex and nuanced. So we've been able to fund things that are uh, sort of out of the box in terms of form-based codes or highest and best use analyses or even feasibility studies for business incubators. So we're pretty pleased with the uh, components so far. And this will be the, the third and final year of the program uh, since we have drawn down on some of those reserves that we were using for the uh, for the program. Uh, so fiscal year 20, we have $100,000 available just like we did last year. And uh, similar to what the MPO does on the Complete Use and TA program, we uh, convene a subcommittee of our staff and our local government planners to uh, review and score uh, the submitted applications. And you see the six criteria that we uh, have utilized there. Uh, so next steps is for us to release the call for projects. We will convene those subcommittees in uh, the winter and uh, have those committee uh, make recommendations in February of 2020 and bring it back to this board for action in uh, March of next year. And uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, <clears throat> yes, on the um, transportation alternatives, mm -hmm. I guess I'm puzzled. Um, it says two submittals per jurisdiction, three if projects on the current list. Yes, uh, I can the submit three if they're on the current list. We are allowing them to submit an additional application. Oh, one more. Yes, okay. one more. So they can put in three. I um, explain however, that, but I missed that. <laughs> so no jurisdiction will be awarded more than two. Okay. However, so even if they do put in three, they are still only eligible to get up to two projects funded. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank Appreciate thank you. it. Do we need action on this one? Um, no. Make sure. No. Just information. Okay, only. it's just information. Right. <clears throat>
Okay, director's report. All right, into the home stretch. Um, Let's see. You are. Yeah, so I just wanted to provide a couple of updates on a few things. Uh, one on the spotlight update. Um, we've been continuing to have discussions with uh, the department on US-19, and uh, it looks like they will be funding um, a more detailed uh, study, a feasibility study of the US-19 North uh, access and uh, innovative intersections. They have an existing contract that they'll be using that for. And uh, Richard, I'm not sure how quickly you'll get started on that. Um, next several months, uh, I would think. And we will be coordinating very closely with county staff and with the local uh, city staff along the US-19 corridor to, to make sure they're engaged in that process uh, appropriately. So that's probably the biggest development on the spotlight emphasis areas. You heard about the, um, the bus rapid transit um, uh, open house that's tonight. Uh, so that's, the, um, that's also related to beach access. Um, yeah. And at first time you mentioned, is that also, will that look at like at the rows like 580 leading into 19 uh, where there is no turn lane? No, that's going to be addressed differently. That'll be addressed uh, through the State Road 580 quarter study. Okay. And we have funding in place this fiscal Perfect. year for that. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to go from downtown Dunedin, from Alt 19, really all the way out to uh, Tampa Road. Yeah. It's a real problem. And it's, you know, and, there, and there's a big additional retailer right there on the corner that's made it even worse. So there's no right turn. You, you have to get almost up to the turn just to get onto 19, so there's no, not like at Curly Road where you have a pretty long right turn lane. Right. It makes traffic a lot and move a lot better, but great. Now that study will really look at more of the, the frontage roads and the main line of US 19 in terms of the access management, uh, because we have a lot of safety problems yep. with the uh, left turners up there. Okay. Um, and yeah, then we- I can add to your comment, sure. Dave. Yes. Um, not only is there no turn lane, but a lot of people are getting into the right-hand lane to turn into the mall after they go under the right. overpass. Well, it takes one. It doesn't take many that, to it stop It takes everybody. one car to yeah. back up an entire lane, and it's got a new, what is it, BJ's there? Yeah. Like, right away really needs to be re acquired, but yeah. we've allowed a lot of building there. I don't know where you're going to get it. It is a huge problem for that intersection. Yeah, I, I've often thought that like those two hours in the morning or yeah, two hours in the morning where people are trying to go to work, that you could almost make that just a right turn lane by putting some kind of lighting at the intersection. Something. So people, if they're going straight through, they would have to stay in that middle or the other yeah. other two lanes because it's really, it's. It, I mean, it backs up almost to Belcher. Yeah. It does. It's, it's gotten that bad in the morning, but anyway. Yeah, those are good thoughts. And the last little piece, piece on the spotlight is uh, we should be getting our Gateway Master Plan draft report in the next couple of weeks. And uh, they have been working, the consultants have been working with the county on dealing with the Airco property in the Master Plan. And I think they've gotten their direction that they need for that. Uh, so I feel, feel good about where we are there. Uh, let's see, the next item is uh, Kennedy report on transit funding. I don't really have anything to tell you there. All three MPOs are in the throes of adopting their long range plans. We are going to be um, working with Hillsborough and Pasco County to have a standalone regional uh, LRTP element that will identify regional, uh, primarily transit connections. Because of the Virgin Brightline train coming into Tampa, we wanna make sure those connections are there for us. Um, so that'll be treated in that document that we will work together on in the first coming weeks of, of 2020, um, month or two of 2020. Um, and then uh, that's really it about uh, regional transit funding. I'd like to talk about our legislative committee next, if you don't mind. Uh, we met uh, for the first time in several months right before this meeting uh, and welcome um, Council Member Albritton to that group. Uh, the legislative committee reviewed the 2019 legislative priorities and essentially said we want to keep those uh, going forward. We're going to uh, work on an urban agriculture um, framework uh, and try to find a bill sponsor for that uh, as a standalone bill versus uh, amending the Right to Farm Act. We will continue to look at uh, flexibility of transportation funding, particularly for the strategic intermodal system to fund transit projects in the SIS especially, and uh, the um, local option gas tax being indexed to inflation. Uh, those were the main items there, and then preserving the housing trust funds. 
those are recommended uh, for the full board. Um, we don't need you to take any action today, um, but at the October meeting, we will bring back um, those for the consideration of the full board and we'll develop some talking points and handouts and begin setting up some meetings with our legislative delegation <coughs> on that. Um, any questions on the legislative committee or further discussion about that? I think that I think the general thought was that uh, we've we've worked hard at, at, at our messaging, and let's stay consistent with that messaging. I think that was Council Member Howard's comment, and I thought it was a good one. So that we don't just keep changing and moving Pivoting and, from and all all kinds. Just keep it consistent and try to make sure that they're that they hear us better. Or and listen, I guarantee you, we'll be playing defense a little bit too. So oh, that's okay. We'll see how that goes. Uh, the next item is the TMA. We're opening up avenues. Yes, opening continue, up avenues. Continue to have conversation. <laughs> the best defense is a good offense, or vice versa. Um, the next item is the TMA uh, meeting update. Uh, the Transportation Management Area Leadership Group met on Friday, and it was a cordial meeting uh, between Pasco, Hillsborough, and Pinellas County, and uh, we're, we were thankful for that. Um, the, the discussion was good. We had Senator Daryl Roussan come to the meeting to talk about regional partnerships, and um, he got um, a lot of uh, information from the TMA representatives on what to pay attention to and what not to do. Uh, there was a plea to not pile on uh, against the uh, all for transportation tax in Hillsborough County because the House uh, weighed in against that. And um, uh, it, it, I read in the paper that it looks like the Senate may as well, but they were pleading with him to encourage the Senate not to do that. Um, also talked about flexibility of transportation funding with Senator Roussan. We were a little disappointed that um, Representative Toledo was invited and, and had to cancel at the last minute, and Senator Simpson was not able to attend. But we will continue to work on maybe inviting one legislative delegation member to those meetings uh, every time we have one, just because I think it's a good, productive conversation. Even if they're not voting to approve something, I think just having the dialogue is helpful. Anything yeah. you want to add? No, I, I think you're, you're, that's a great comment. I mean, you've been out there trying to talk to our delegation one-on-one, -on -one, and I think that's been a big improvement. I know some of us at this dais have also been doing that, but I think on a regional level, it's also good for them to hear firsthand what's going on, especially when they're not being asked for money or they're being asked to vote on something, but rather to get a sense of the commitment from this region to let us do some things and let us do them the way we want to do them. So to hear from us, I think, is a good thing. So if we can get one or two of them at each meeting, it would be awesome, I think. So. Your, um, your board packet has the materials we've been handing out to our legislative delegation, and uh, Hillary and um, Sarah have helped me put that together, and I think it's been really impactful. We have a nice leave behind, nice new folders. Um, let's see, the next item I'm going to cover is... Um, I just want to talk about this great little partnership that we had for the trail crossing of 580 uh, in Dunedin uh, for the Pinellas Trail. And I want to thank Ken Jacobs and Pinellas County staff, uh, as well as the Florida Department of Transportation. Uh, Peter Shu was great to work with on this project, uh, as well as Tom Washburn with the county. Um, we went to the state uh, at the urging of Mayor Bajowski and you, Commissioner Eggers, uh, after a crash. Uh, in the intersection of the trail in 580 a few months back and said, what can we do? What are some quick things we can do to improve trail safety? And the department suggested we come up with um, um, a strategy for better detection of bicyclists who, 70% um, of whom do not press the button for the flashing beacons to go off. The pedestrians do a little bit better job because they're stopped or going slower. And um, so we've installed... Uh, passive detection thermal cameras <clears throat> facing north and south on the trail. Um, um, and they're mounted under the solar panels uh, on the flashing beacons. <coughs> and these, uh, uh, the, the original solar panels weren't big enough, so we had to order some new ones. So it took a little longer to get them installed, but uh, they're working. I went out there and did field work over the weekend uh, <laughs> and uh, observed for about 30 minutes standing out there. And they were, they were operational. Uh, one of the buttons wasn't operational in the northbound for the pedestrians, but um, sometimes that happens and they'll get corrected. But the, um, the beacons were uh, detecting bicyclists moving in about 20 to 30 feet from the trail crossing. And we've ad installed advanced flashing beacons now, too. So they're not only at the crossing, but they're, uh, I'm not sure the dimensions, but they're some distance uh, on the east and the west of the crossing. 
And that's a really good first step strategy. The department is also funding a before and after study. Uh, so they've done the before, obviously, and over the next several weeks, they're going to be calibrating the cameras, uh, I think the week of the 16th, uh, just to make sure they're accurately detecting. And then the, the after study will look at a period of time for compliance and motorist yield rates. And, uh, you know, it's not a high crash location, but uh, you're vulnerable and uh, uh, it can be a high speed uh, corridor as people see the light green at Alt-19. They're not paying attention to what's right around them and they punch it to make that left turn. Or they get blinded by the sun. Or blinded by the sun. That's a real issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to thank everybody because that's the kind of partnerships that come together. Mm -hmm. All we did was host the party and uh, other people. Dunedin came up with $7,500 in cash to buy the cameras. Uh, DOT did the before and after and the design plans and the county installed and is maintaining. So um, kudos to everybody. And it's still a, it's still a stop uh, for, the, for the trail people. Correct. They're still supposed to be stopping. They are. They are. Thank you. So that's, uh, that's really all I had. Uh, we do have some informational items that I'll cover, unless you want to go over these. Um, no, you can. You can. I'll. Okay, just real quick, uh, in the informational items, we have our fatalities uh, uh, map and uh, the, the report that Secretary Gwen sends out every two weeks um, for, for quite a few weeks uh, because we haven't met since July. Um, and um, I want to call your attention to some upcoming events. Uh, we mentioned the open house for PSTA tonight. Uh, on the 24th is the I-275 public hearing at the First Baptist Church on Gandhi in St. Petersburg. Uh, that's at 5.30 p.m. And uh, that will be an opportunity for people to learn about the I-275 corridor improvements. Uh, the Congress for the New Urbanism has a statewide meeting in Tampa at the Armature Works on October 3rd and 4th. And we are a bronze level sponsor of that, a whole $250. Uh, and then we have the National Safe Routes to School Conference and the Gulf Coast Safe Streets Summit in November, and we will be part of the panel uh, for our complete streets work. Uh, unless anybody has any other items, I'm done. Um, Secretary Gwen, did you have anything that you wanted to bring up or any comments? Or You're welcome. Oh, I'm glad to be here today with everything going on. Thank you uh, for spending your time here. I really appreciate that. It's, uh, it's great to have you, and it's great... I really love the partnership that we, we've developed and continue to hope that it grows and flourishes. So, uh, but thank you again. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. Anything from uh, anybody here? And uh, even, yes. I just want to thank all the partners for working with Dunedin on this issue. Um, I did post about it on my social media and got just a huge, huge amount of positive response. And, um, people very appreciative um, they hadn't even seen it yet but just appreciative that it had been done and it was being done biggest feedback I'm getting from people again is the the bicycle folks that don't push the button um, and the inconsistency of markings at all the various trail crossings yeah. that nobody really knows what to do it's not consistent so to that point we are going to dust off that 2013 study and uh, take a fresh look at that and re-engage our county and city partners on looking at some consistency of the trail crossing. Uh, we'll see what we can get done, but I will at least engage that conversation. Thank you. And we'll work with you also on Honeymoon Island. Yes. We've been having some conversations. Uh, uh, Representative Sprouls took a real interest in that. Um, as you know, we've been asking for financial assistance to improve the access at the most popular state park in Florida at the end of the causeway. And um, uh, everybody's kind of pockets are empty right now, but we're hoping that we can get $500,000. Part of the problem is getting the state agencies to talk. I think um, and I did, uh, email, the EP has not been as responsive as I we'd like them to be. I did email our city manager to reach out to Eric. Um, okay. So we'll see what happens issue. in the next couple of weeks mm -hmm. on that. Uh, and then finally, I just want to mention one other thing. We're hopeful that we can get the downtown mobility study for St. Petersburg going as quickly as possible. Uh, we've had a little hiccup with uh, the money we thought we had available. Um, so there's uh, continuing dialogue to see if we've got the state funding in place for that. Um, but we're hoping to get started as quickly as uh, the beginning of uh, November on that. Probably be realistic. Super. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, we are adjourned.